Hello everyone, welcome to Screenwalks. My name is Marco Demutis. I'm digital curator at Photo Museum Winterthur in Switzerland. Screenwalks is a collaborative program launched by the Photographers Gallery in London and Photo Museum Winterthur in Switzerland with support by ProHelvetia. This series of fortnightly live streamed event was created as a joint effort by both institutions to continue the investigations of the changing role of digital and natural images. Every screenwalk is led by an artist, a curator, or a researcher, performing guided explorations of the places where their core artistic practices take place. Every event has a different format. It can be a studio visit, a performance, a lecture, a live show, a conversation, or a behind the scene in the making of a work. Some screenwalks are more contemplative and some others more interactive. If this is your first screenwalk, please make sure to visit our website, screenwalks.com, where you will find the recordings of all our previous events. Now, for those of you in Zoom, your microphone should be muted. If not, please go ahead and mute it now. If this event is being recorded and will be archived, so please turn off your camera if you don't want to be recorded. Hello, I'm John Uriarte, curator of digital programs at the Photographers Gallery. Tonight, we will explore the notions of access, visibility, and desire in the current network digital landscape. In order to introduce our event tonight, I would like to first go back to Abby Wargroup's Atlas Memosini, one of the first explorations of the links and connections between images. Instead of analyzing images individually, Wargroup created a series of thematic panels where you, he will gather photographs and illustrations taken from different sources. He analyzes those images through the links he could find and establish between their visual surfaces, creating a network of representational meanings. If we fast forward to today, when photographs are mostly digital born and shared online, we should consider how the current visual networks have evolved since then. The meaning of an online image is highly influenced by the context in which it is being shown, the visibility that it reaches, and the impact that it provokes. However, Access and visibility on the internet doesn't allow the same logic as it used to do on Warburg's time. The data that lays behind the surface of a photograph has become more relevant, taking over its representational power. Uploading a photograph many times, huge in size, or on the social media channels of a respected organization doesn't mean that it will have more chances to be seen. The gatekeepers of online content, the corporations who own the search engines and their algorithms, are using other parameters to bring visual contents to the forefront of the, of the platforms. Through specific algorithms that regulate the order in which images are indexed on, for instance, Google, image, uh, Google Images hierarchy, these companies create notions of, him, uh, of image value and determine the definition of order of things. Yet the indexing, indexing of algorithms that regulate the internet are unable to differentiate between desired and facts, hopes, and memories. That's where our guide tonight intervenes to exploit the system and use it against itself. Taking us through the network logics of search engines, we will have Gretchen Andy with us tonight, a former Google engineer turned search engine artist who has been able to position her artwork as the first results of a series of popular searches. Her work reflects on the desires and aspirations of becoming part of the artwork making use of her network hacks, glitter, and code in order to reach them. Her screen work tonight will not only show how her work process is carried out, but it will also aim to reinforce her prominent position on network search results. She will lead a performance behind the scenes work that will be part of her latest work, eventually helping her artwork to show up on the top results of the search engines. Once the first part of the event, uh, which will take um, more or less half an hour is over, we will open the screen to questions, comments, and thoughts from the audience. Uh, Gretchen is represented by Anka Kultis Gallery, who will be hosting her next exhibition opening on London on April 22nd. Her work is currently on display in Berlin at Koning Gallery as part of the Artists Online. And this year, she is also artist in resident at London's National Gallery X and has also an exhibition at Francisco Carolino Museum of Modern Art and Contemporary Art. Uh, thank you so much, Gretchen, for being with us tonight. We are very excited to have you with us. Uh, the screen is yours. 
Thank you for giving me the screen, John, and the Photographer's Gallery, and Marco um, at Photo Winter in um, outside Zurich, Switzerland, wherever you, you are in, in Switzerland, um, and for Sam for helping out as well. Um, thank you to everyone who is joining me and us on this screen walk. Um, I'm Gretchen Andrew, and I want to tell you tonight, or maybe today, depending on where you are, about everything that I want. And when we talk about desire, desire is a really interesting and complex thing, but it's also very vulnerable. To say that I want something or to tell you about something I want is also to admit that I don't have it, that there's a space of separation between me and this thing that I'm desiring. So it's kind of scary that I'm going to be telling you not just about who I am, but who I want to be. And in this process, I hope you feel invited to explore those ideas within yourself as well. The reason why I'm doing this though, is because while it's difficult for us humans to talk about desire, the internet cannot parse desire. The only relationship that binary code, artificial intelligence, and the internet in general understands is relevance. What is the measured algorithm of distance between two things? So it doesn't understand not just desire, but hope, love, fear, longing. It's all compressed into relevance. And while this has all sorts of technical apocalyptic implications, I also find it quite poetic. The poetics that the internet can't parse desire. The internet fails around desire means that desire is part of our humanity. It's part of something that distinguishes us from machines and makes us human and can also lead us to be quite close to our humanity and then I think ultimately to each other as well. So I'm going to take the screen away from my face and I'm going to show you what I do in my practice and how my practice takes us around the internet. Sharing my screen. Great. So in my practice, I make vision boards. And in these vision boards, um, I'm expressing my personal, professional, and political desires for the future. They're glittery, they're glammy, they're about luxury, they're about time with friends, but then they're also about manipulating major political institutions and they're manipulating power in general. So a couple of them here, this is, as John mentioned, I have an exhibition in London that will actually be, you'll actually be able to visit if you're able to be in London on, starting on April 22nd. And the vision boards themselves are these images that come from a very feminine, trivialized, girly place where I'm making something that intentionally looks quite playful and quite positive on its surface, but then as you'll see, has pretty serious implications in the way that it spreads throughout the internet. So historically, I've done this in a couple of ways. Um, addressing art world power is one of my favorites. Um, because it gets to be an institutional critique, not just of the big tech and of the technical systems that the internet has, but also of the art world and within the whole history of institutional critique. So one of the first major ones I did is I hacked my way into the Freeze Los Angeles Art Fair. And then I did the same with the Whitney Biennial. I tricked the internet into making all of my dreams come true. And then I won the Turner Prize and how this all manifests itself within the search engine is I make these vision boards about what I want. And then I program them in the process I'm going to share with you this evening into, into becoming top search results. So as you can see here, actually, you don't need my name there. Um, when you Google cover of art forum, my vision boards about wanting to be there on this cover of art forum are the top search results. And as you can see, like it's it's quite obvious to us people that like this top search result is not I don't know if you can, is not 
an actual cover of art form. This is a drawing, this is art, this is aspirational. We as humans understand that there is still a space of separation between me and this professional goal. However, through my process, Google has only learned that I am relevant to all of these things, that I'm relevant to the Turner Prize, that I'm relevant to the cover of Art Forum, that I'm relevant to um, the next American president, which is um, another work that I did where um, I hacked my um, vision boards about what I wanted the next American president to value into into the top search results. So let's see, here we go, images. Um, and as you can see, my vision boards um, have replaced the candidates and the candidates started to mix themselves back in because so much press picked up this article and it was doing things like putting the vision boards on top of the faces, but that wasn't actually technically necessary. Okay, so in taking you through this process, my, my hope is that you're going to recognize all of these places on the internet, but that you're going to see them in a slightly different way to see their potential uses in a slightly different way. Okay, so the next thing I'm taking on, let me go back to my face for a little bit. The next search result that I'm going to be taking on the next art world hack that you're going to watch me perform live tonight is for the search result contemporary art auction record. I've been using Sarah Thornton's seven days in the art world as my guide to which arts institutions to hack. Where do I want to have a sense of belonging? As someone who didn't grow up around artists or go to art school, to even know what it meant to become important in the art world, I had to be taught. And I was taught it mostly through this book called Seven Days in the Art World. And I've been working my way through these various searches, these various institutions that she addresses. And I figured it was a really great time to talk about my desire for money, my desire to have work that makes me rich and makes my team rich. And this is um, of particular, particular fun right now because what just happened with an NFT breaking the contemporary art auction record, um, as big of a buzz as that was, um, my work will soon be the top search results for that search instead. And the, um, the convergence of financial systems and technical systems, and then also these feelings of success around money and around institutions, um, or one of the reasons why now is the moment for me to take on Christie's and Sotheby's. There's also um, something in the art world where when an artist's work first comes up to auction, it's a quite nerve wracking moment. There's this fear of prices going down ever and what does this mean for the market? Instead of opening myself up to that vulnerability, I'm by admitting that I want this, by talking about one of these things us artists aren't supposed to openly talk about, which is I wanna be famous, I wanna be rich, I wanna belong. Um, and to name those institutions that I want to belong to, I've taken out the scariness and the fear of this moment for when one of my visions boards does inevitably go to auction or inevitably because I'm visualizing it and hopefully manifesting it. Um, so it's no longer a scary moment. It's a moment that an institution supposedly would hold that power. And I'm taking it back in the same way that I've been hacking my way into all of these arts institutions. Before I go into what I've done offline in this process, I, um, I do also wanna say that one of the most magic things about my practice or like what's magic to me as its maker is that by aspiring to be part of the art world, by pretending, by visualizing it, and then hacking my way into it technically, I can't explain that this is all actually also happening. You heard in John's introduction, everything I've got going on this year, the honor of being with you guys here tonight in this context with these two great institutions is something that doesn't happen in the natural language processing, but is happening in the IRL physical world, um, which I just think is 
really resonant and amazingly fun in the way that this image goes from something that is aspirational and has been transforming itself back offline into something that is also impacting my daily life. So when taking on contemporary art auction record, um, what I've done offline before this session with you guys is I've made some vision boards and the vision board process takes place offline. They are very physical objects. And let's see, I've got some in the series pulled up here. So these objects and um, these these objects that I've made, these vision boards, these images ultimately that I've made, even though they're quite three-dimensional and they take me forever to photograph to translate into the digital space, the objects within them are, they're all about growth and money and aspiration and desire. And this is the one we'll primarily be working with today. This is the one that's up in Kune Gallery right now, physically. <laughs> You can see the champagne and the moments of celebration and the implications of success that are all these meta outcomes of being someone whose work is worth what would be a contemporary art auction record. So I've made these vision boards previous to this. The vision boards then become an image um, through a photographic process um, that is I, I mean, it's fairly straightforward, but also I very much believe that photographing anything is a transformative process, that even when I was making oil paintings, I think of the digitization of a physical work as a transformative process. And as these works become almost like a, like a, a you know, I think of them as like a Sally Levine, like after Walker Evans version of the original work. When they go into virtual reality, it's a whole different medium. It's a whole different context. But that also, for me, really represents this networked desire, this networked space that I want my practice to work in. I work physically because I like physical things, but also these objects, while representing a very digital and very performative practice, get to operate in a very traditional art world in a very traditional way. You can put them on a gallery wall, you can buy them, you can you know, do all of the things that were kind of traditionally pre-NFT at least required to make it to a certain level in the art world. And in that way, the image of these works acts like a virus online and the physical works also act like a virus in the physical art world, infiltrating and moving around according to the algorithm and rules of the art world where a branded physical unique object is um, not required, but makes ease into these power systems um, more straightforward. So I've made these vision boards and um, like I said, they are, they're all like about how I want to have a contemporary art auction record. And you might hear me throughout the course of this session say contemporary art auction record, contemporary art auction record. I'm recording the audio from this session and I'm also going to be using the text, speech to text on my websites as unique content that also helps drive changes in the search engine. So I've taken them, I've digitized them. These aren't confusing to humans, I presume, because not only with this, with this particular work have I um, made them vision boards, I have taken the vision boards and photoshopped them. Oh, I'm not sharing my screen again, am I? Mm, share screen. Okay, I've taken these vision boards and I've done a purposely janky Photoshop job of them into contemporary art auction, what, what used to be the top search results for contemporary art auction record. And I've hopefully done this in a way where I'm visualizing my work being there, you're visualizing my work being there, the internet is visualizing my work being there, but this isn't confusing. No one's going to see this image and think that I've already achieved this goal. We as humans are standing on one side of this and laughing at the technology, the fact that technology can't understand the difference between this, which is um, a Gerhard Richter, I presume, and what I end up putting into it, which is one of my vision boards about wanting to be the next Gerhard Richter. 
And so each of these vision boards is put in the context with something that we can understand. Like these new digital images are almost like second edition vision boards because they are visualizing what it would be like for my work to be there. Okay, so I then, after I've done this and I've made these images from the images from the vision boards, I my next step is to optimize them in ways that are very pleasing to the search engine. So that includes adding some metadata. It includes making them not very high resolution because while well, as an artist, I would normally want my work to be seen in great detail, Google prioritizes things of specific sizes because it has an opinion on what it thinks that usability and page loading time and all of this stuff that it prides itself on prefers very small images. And um, most of this is, like, so there's there's like some things I've done offline as well that deal with, like I said, this um, thing in HTML called alt text. I have purchased a URL where the URL is contemporary-art-auction-record. And this is another thing where like, that's a really annoying URL, but it's also a URL that Google most prefers when identifying what the contemporary art auction record object is. I make this WordPress site, which I say, this website is a net art vision board. Its purpose is to help me and the universe and the internet clearly visualize and manifest contemporary art auction record. On this site, I co-create the future with the universe and the internet. I then will take, um, I've done some research in advance where using free Google search tools, I've identified about 75 words, or actually more, lots more, 400 words <laughs> that are related to the search contemporary art auction record. And so when I start making content, when I start talking about what I want all over the internet, I know that using these words helps sort of coo Google into believing that I'm fulfilling its expectations. I'm not doing something out of the ordinary. These are the sort of words it expects to see with the search contemporary art auction record. It, ex it expects to see museum modern art. It expects to see abstract painter. It expects to see contemporary wall decor. And pretty soon it's going to be learning to expect to see Gretchen Andrew. So there are then a series of questions that, uh, oh here, that I ask myself about this contemporary art auction record. And usually what I'd be doing here is I would be making, um, I'd be writing out text, but because I'm speaking with you and I have a voice to text um, platform going right now on my phone, I can just tell you, we can just talk about what we want. and by putting this into text and putting this text on this website with all of these other images, Google starts to pick up my desire as accomplished reality. So one question might be, do I really want to have one of my vision boards achieve a contemporary art auction record? And I would, I would write down or I would say to you right now as it's being converted into text, I really do want to create a work that's a contemporary art vision board. I, I want to achieve this professional goal because I feel like it would help me belong. It would help me live a certain lifestyle. I could have as much champagne as I want all the time. I could fly first class. When I have a contemporary art auction record, it's going to feel so good. And then another question might be, well, yeah, how is it going to feel? What are you going to be wearing when you achieve the dream? Your, your, when you achieve your dream, who's going to be there and what are you going to be wearing? So then I would say on my WordPress site, when I achieve a contemporary art auction record, I'm going to be wearing a really fabulous dress, like maybe the dress that Taylor Swift wore to the Grammys because that thing is awesome. And in this contemporary, when I get the results that my contemporary art auction record has been achieved, because it'll be secondary market, there'll be a collector of mine that's also celebrating. And this collector will probably be a fabulous woman who I've gotten to know over many years and we'll drink champagne together and we'll celebrate this networked community success of having achieved a contemporary art auction record. So 
basically over the course of a couple months, I would just answer a lot of these questions. I would do a lot of visualization and well, there's some metadata and there's some code and there's some things that I do. The majority of my process actually takes place in human language, in natural language processing, just in the completely, totally human comprehensible language of desire. I build relevance between me and this thing that I want. And again, as people, as I'm talking about this, you understand I'm not there yet. However, I know that Google doesn't know that. I know that Facebook doesn't know that. I know that algorithms in general don't understand this desire. So there's all of this content that I create that is essentially me just being very vulnerable, like in a like early 2000s style blog. And I use this to build these concepts of relevance. Um, then my next step is to take this WordPress link and to share it all over the internet in a way where I'm not just talking on WordPress about what I want. I'm also talking um, on all of these other sites. Actually, before I go there, I wanna show you, this is a finished net art vision board that I did for cover of art forum. And you can see here how, actually, I think, that I've, these images have been posted here. It's this net art vision board. I'm talking about the history of these net art vision boards and I'm using the word net, or I'm using the word contemporary art auction record as well as this other list of words that are like, deemed to be related to this search. And that helps achieve these concepts of relevance. And then I take this I take two things. I take this URL, which is this WordPress website that I own with my contemporary art auction record net art vision board. And on this site, um, I want to spread this URL around, but then I also want to spread the URL of these images around. These images are hosted on WordPress, but if you go in and you look at the image address, you see that the keyword here, contemporary art auction record, is multiple times in the file name and in the host as well. And these are just search engine optimization tricks that I use to build these concepts of relevance. I then also take them and I put them on YouTube. And um, there was videos of me making this digital collages in Photoshop. I just did a screen recording. I'm putting those up on YouTube and then I'll, I'll title it Contemporary Art Auction Record YouTube Vision Board. I so, so, so want my work to achieve a Contemporary Art Auction Record. Uh, and I might, I'll probably go back later and add like a lot of data, not a lot of data, sorry, a lot of text where I'm adding more unique text, more description. I'll probably take some of the um, speech to text recording from this session and also include that into this description because Google values unique content. Google values quantity of text. And I'll just by every morning for the next 30 days or so getting up and spending 30 minutes talking and writing about what I want. That desire becomes content. And that content gets associated with these images. And these images then manifest themselves as top search results. So um, instead of just using the thumbnail that YouTube provides for me, I'll take one of those optimized images that, um, like I said, is basically the image, the same image I showed you that I made in Photoshop, but um, is smaller and has the metadata of the keyword like added into its file name. So I'm gonna post that. Oh, it's, it's not made for kids. And um, that's going to be public right now. It's going to have an instant premiere because I think YouTube will like that. And with all of these things, like, like I have like, you know, I've got a YouTube channel with a respectable like 100 subscribers. This isn't a social media play. This isn't um, a play of social media power. I have in my YouTube account here, you can even see, um, I've got videos with 22 views, 17 views, three views, 12 views. I'm not buying likes, I'm not buying views. 
literally just by making content and connecting it to each other through URLs, Google starts to build these, this concept of this is truth, this is relevance. I'm gonna do the same thing on SoundCloud, which is a site where I have no followers, but allows me to change my name to the keyword, change my profile image to one of these optimized images that will become a top search result. And also very importantly, allows me, actually I wanna keep that one because I'm still doing that project too, um, allows me to host um, URLs, some URL where you get to, like anytime there's a profile that allows you to say, oh, this is my website or, oh, this is my Twitter, putting those links there also continues to build relevance. And so I will, you know, I would change this background image here too. I would then go on to Twitter and I would say, again, very respectable 600 followers, but I'm not like social media famous. This is all data play. This is all a natural language processing play. This is all like, how do algorithms work and how do I make them work for me? I would share this website um, that, that I'd share my WordPress. And I would say, something like, just made a new net art vision board and share the link. Oh, I'd say of temporary art auction record. Let's throw an image in there. We'll just upload the image again. And now the image is also hosted here. This link is also on my Twitter. Again, I'm not breaking any terms of service. I'm not lying to anyone. I'm not deceiving the, you know, I'm not, I'm doing something that it doesn't intend me to do, which is talk about what I want in a very structured way. I go on and I will, I'll do this offline later, but I use Pinterest. As you can see, I've got pins for my past projects. And I actually have a list here of about 60, I call it my internet imperialism checklist. It's all of the sites that I use for each of my projects. There's Yelp, there's TripAdvisor, there's Eventbrite, there's Wikimedia, there's Quora, there's Google Sites, there's IMGR, there's DeviantArt, there's Reddit, there's Tumblr, there's LiveJournal, there's MySpace, there's Medium, there's archive.org, there's WikiHow. Like, and for something like WikiHow, what I might do would be like make write a WikiHow article on how to make a 3D collage on Canvas. And by writing this article about something that I am doing, I'm also able to upload my images to the site and those images continue to spread throughout the internet. Or I might write a review on Yelp of a local art store and say, I bought this canvas at Blick and it was really good and here's what I made on it. And you're allowed to do that. You're allowed to just, and I, I would title it and say, this is a contemporary art auction record piece I made. Like the people at Blick were so friendly, four stars. And in following all the rules, I'm, I'm, I'm breaking the system, but I'm not doing it illegally. I'm not even breaking terms of service. It's about intentionality. And what I love about that is to express an intention in art is so core to the whole history of not just the photographic medium, not just the digital photographic medium, not just my vision boards, but that inducing of your perspective and extending it beyond the canvas is something that is very connecting in my work to the whole history of art that I love and what got me into being an artist. So I go through this, I like put all of this stuff all over the internet on the checklist. I'm basically just being like an annoying person on every website who's like, let's talk about what I want. I want to tell you about what I want. I want to tell you how good it's going to feel and how fancy my dress is going to be when I get it. Um, and so like what's happening now and um, what's already started to happen now um, is these images um, are slowly building this relevance, slowly taking this desire into the photograph, into the image, into content. And um, over the next, my guess would be in the next like month and a half, 
you'll see these images become the top search results. I can't time them exactly, um, but there's also something kind of fun and quite performative about that as well, especially when I have exhibitions coming up. Um, I, one of the reasons why I'm not putting all of my, like my Twitter profile URL right now um, isn't this project yet because I've got these exhibitions, the one at Koenig, um, is actually part of this contemporary art auction record project. And if you're in Berlin, like do go check it out. I know they have slots, you can book and see it. Um, but with Anka Kulti in Febu February, February was when it was originally gonna be. In April, on April 22nd, um, the works in that show manipulate the search results for, let me show you. Okay, so, um, one of the institutions I took on for my show with Anka Kulti is the search best MFA. So instead of getting, um, oh, you should go to Columbia and spend $100,000 or oh, you should go to the Slade and spend two years of your life. Like I really respect um, institutional education. I'm a huge believer in the way I got my undergrad degree in information theory and information systems. I'm not anti-institution. I'm just anti that there is a specific path to succeed or um, that experience needs to be validated in a certain way. So these works are about wanting to feel secure in my own experience, wanting my what I did instead of going to art school to be accepted by the art world as the best advanced degree I could have received. And that's the topic of these works. And you'll see those, um, well, you see those now <laughs> in the search results for best MFA. So not the Royal Academy, not the Slade, not Cal Arts my life um, for each of these projects. Oh, and then there's another one that's part of that show too. I might as well show you. Um, this one's still in process, but it's um, map of the EU, which will be a Brexit reversal scenario and works that include in maps, in, there are maps inside the vision boards that include the UK back into the EU. So it's a little like my European edition of the next American president where these works are about, you know, wanting to acknowledge how these borders have changed and to pretend that at any point in time, like this is the permanent real result. We can talk about borders historically and we can talk about borders in the future as well. Because what also happens in my work is that as a result, of becoming top search results, almost initially as a side effect, my vision boards become weighted entries into what is educating Google's artificial intelligence. And um, so like when Google's learning, what is the map of the EU? It's now like, oh, this vision board is the map of the EU. And it has to reconcile not just historic data that has existed about presidents or about the Turner Prize, but there's actually a way to use vision boards and to use art to educate artificial intelligence based on the world we want instead of the world that we've had and previously measured. So the last part of this process that I really wanna share with you guys, because I think it's very cool, is not only am I performing these vision board manipulations online and the images are spreading like a virus in this way, I am, for each of my search projects, I use Rhizome's Conifor to, to, I've got to log in again, um, to document the change in search results over time. So every week I have a live web archive recording of each of my searches. So I just showed you what best MFA looked like today, but I can go back and show you that I was already working on this project. Let's see, when was the first one? Oh, wow. Like, um, like, June, July. I was already starting this in July. I guess that makes sense. I knew that. <laughs> it's been a weird year. And you can see historically what the top search results for best MFA were back in July. And you can see that, you know, it's all about expensive art school programs and sort of this very traditional path. And then you can see maybe, let's see, in um, October here, one of my top results is like starting to creep its way up. And this evolution, this thing that occurs over time, it, it gets performed almost like in this like tree falling in the forest sort of way where this occurs online, whether or not anybody has seen it. It's manipulating AI, whether or not anyone sees it. 
and um, these this tool is like one of my absolute favorite ways in to make something where like so for the next American president search um, I have this this um, video that's now a digital piece of work that links to the archive of the search results and also just becomes another digital object that this is one of the vision boards about the next American president. It's gone through, it's become a top search result, and now it's becoming another digital, um, well, in this case, moving image. And these were the search results on the week of the US um, 2020 presidential election. On the day of the election, or the week of the election, this was the top search results for that page. And that becomes like this other mark in time where the internet has started to move and erase and change things because it doesn't deal with time in the same way it doesn't deal with metaphor and it doesn't deal with nuance and it doesn't deal with um, you know these liminal complexities, these not not situations. Um, but I think the note that I want to end on is that this like this is at least the way that I think about this. Like this is a way where all of these failures of the internet, all of these complexities and problems of what we're trusting the system to do become much more playful and creative when we think about it as a creative medium, when we think about it as something that should be manipulated like clay, that it, it doesn't, it's not like apocalyptic because someone's leading us into like misinformation about the COVID vaccine. It's just another, area that we recognize that there's a, like, when we see paintings, we know that somebody made those and that there's somebody's perspective and someone wanted to share something with us. And that gets lost a little bit more in photography where there's authorship and there is perspective and there's always bias in images, but it starts to lose it a little bit in photography. And then at least the literacy around that, I think most of us here on this call probably know that, but there's a um, sort of a study that has to really be given in like and educated around that. And then when those images are on the internet, and then when those images are on the internet as top search result, there's even less literacy and understanding about who these came from and how the person got there. And in my practice, I sort of want this dual thing when people see my girly feminine vision boards as top search results, I want them to both go like, like, wow, I got you in, that's so cool. How'd you do that? And then also be like, wait, you did that? We should all be very worried, like what's going on? Like, how do we really evaluate our relationship to the image online? And how can those images in the future of AI be used in a way that really does invite more people into AI's education? And I don't think we can stop people from manipulating the internet. So like, it's just for me about like inviting more of you guys to join me. And thank you for doing that today. Um, and that for now concludes what I had planned. It was longer than I thought, sorry. Thank you so much, uh, Gretchen. It's been like a brilliant talk, uh, an amazing, even uh, tutorials at some point of how to manipulate the, the internet. And uh, you've been super generous, I would say, and uh, uh, showing us your, your practice. There are several questions uh, that uh, the people, like the audience has been sending through. And in fact, I want to ask uh, some of them to to unmute themselves, uh, like, uh, and to bring the questions forward. We're gonna start maybe with Eric, with Eric Face. I don't know if Eric can open your microphone. Here I am. Hey. Um, yeah, I, your work is amazing. I love what you're doing. It's really, I'm totally won over. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I have, I have two. I guess two questions. One, I was wondering if you could say something about what you've tried that hasn't worked, because there is a like a long term thing to like you do something and then it takes a while before you know if it if it's working or not. So I'm wondering if you could say anything about a failure that was kind of interesting to you. And I also wonder, like, at what point you'll be done with this approach of work? Like, when will this not be interesting to you anymore? Thanks. Um, great questions. Um, the um, I had an interesting like failure when I was doing the Turner Prize, where um, Google started to pick up the search term Turner Prize winner instead of like Turner Prize or whatever I had originally been optimizing around, and I had to pivot, um, sort of like double down on um, what what was becoming more successful, and that one was tying with the show quite tightly. So it. Um, 
but I have to also just be honest that like I keep I've been doing I've been doing this process for five years and I just started at the end of 2019 to do it with vision boards instead of oil paintings and the vision boards definitely have like this whole connection into desire it fits my, me much more I get to bring gender into it like into like this kind of question about political and technical power so um, even though I've been doing the search process for five years the what the um, sort of artistic um, output of it looks like has changed a lot very recently and um, that also just makes me think that like I can't believe that like it's, it's only gotten easier both because my like the manipulation has only gotten easier um, both because I have a process down and that process like no longer needs to change um, like that checklist site literally just like post 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 and because the way that I do this is so tied to how companies use the same tools for e-commerce, Google would have to like stop making money to stop what I'm doing. These sites, like it's so integrally tied to the way they accumulate power that um, I often get asked about like all these supposed updates to how smart Google AI is getting. I see it getting dumber, or at least like in the areas that are important to me around art and metaphor and nuance. So um, I think parts of it will continue to grow and change. And then as far as my interest goes, um, I'm just finding more ways to integrate more systems into it. And I think that's what I'm finding so interesting right now. Like thinking about contemporary art auction is also being a hack of financial systems and continuing to hack political systems and taking something like the US tax code where I'm now thinking about that as a system of power that relates into the way that I make my work. And it's another thing with certain sets of rules that were set to favor certain people, but can be used creatively for people who really understand it. And so like, for example, like if I drink like a $500 bottle of champagne and I put the wire hood on my vision board, that's a material expense, I believe. So <laughs> we're working on those sort of systems as well. Thanks a lot. Um, there's another question from Hannah, who unfortunately has not a very good um, microphone quality. So she asked us if we can bring it to you. I'm just going to read it. Um, I love your work and find it very exciting to get some insights today. As a young woman of the same age, I can relate to your issues and desires. You've talked a lot about wanting to get rich with or through your art. So art as a tool to fulfill your dreams. In that context, I'd be interested to know what art means to you in general and whether you also have an idealistic connection to it or rather the commercial economic one in the sense of art as a job or as a tool. Yeah, that's, that's a great question because it definitely can be um, somewhat misinterpreted. Like, right, right, like the skill set that I use to do this is highly marketable. And if I were just out to like make some cash, I would probably be employed at a place like Google still. Um, but the way I think about it is being rewarded and celebrated and paid to be yourself. And that is something that I think a lot of emerging artists as I was emerging was something I sort of felt like you had to trade. And for me, there's almost something more feminist and more integrating to demand to be one of the many people that get paid to do this because there are people who make a lot of money in the art world and deciding that you're going to be part of it, I think has to be a decision. And for me, I've also made it a conceptual decision, especially in the way that it relates to institutions of power and money and finance being a huge institution of power and sort of holding those um, cards of those money strings and aspiring to do that, just like with my other projects, like it's starting to happen more and more. And um, I really believe in the magic of not just the hacking that I'm doing, but in the magic of admitting that to myself and then also to the people I work with that I want to be part of that system as well. Um, thank you, Gretchen. We have another question from uh, Ronnie, Ronnie Hall. Uh, maybe uh, you can open your microphone and do it uh, yourself. I think you're muted. Let's try. Hi, Ronnie. I think that you can talk now. Um, while we don't 
Uh, while we don't hear any, I'm gonna make the, like, the question myself. Uh, I was asking, uh, does Gretchen ever have problems with Google thinking she's spamming uh, the various spaces? I have been um, kicked off of two sites before and I was able to, so not with Google, um, because I make a lot of unique content, it doesn't get registered ever as spam. I've been temporarily kicked off of Yelp um, because I posted a, um, <laughs> a painting that was about something on a site. It was actually about a hike, so I wasn't interfering with anyone's business. And I was like, oh, this painting is about the response that I had when I was at this place hiking. And Yelp kicked me off temporarily and said that it's not synonymous with a standard experience of the place, um, which is their guideline. Um, and I was able to eventually appeal that. Um, and so getting reinstated is almost more interesting to me because it means I've had a conversation with some content moderators and I've gotten to speak through a couple of these issues. Um, I've had, I initially had issues with Wikipedia and Wikimedia because to um, share images on Wikimedia, you're supposed to be a dead artist, like basically like the initial guideline was like almost explicitly like dead famous artist. And I got into a big discussion about the way that um, content on Wikimedia is a big input into artificial intelligence and how art can really help us understand, you know, mental illnesses and diseases and all of these, these other things. And then also just the demographic um, in, like problematics of the fact that only that if you're a dead famous artist, you're probably white and male and a white male getting to artistically decide how the female body is represented as an example is something that um, Wikipedia and Wikimedia should be thinking about. So I eventually won that one as well. <laughs> um, and yeah, there, there have been a couple of things sort of like that. I, I've, I have lost one where I tried to argue that my works were photographs because like, oh, there's all these like photograph contests and I can talk all day again about photographing as an artistic process. Um, but um, if it's a photography competition website, they do not want a photo of, of anything, but like they don't want a photo of a vision board or a photo of a painting. Great. We have another question from the chat from TG. Should we see, excuse me, should we see if, if we, Ronnie can type her question if her microphone wasn't able to ever work? Shaking her head in despair. No, okay, that's all right. Email me or something. We can talk. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do a mix. We'll see. Like uh, you know, we'll try if people want to or are able to. Um, yeah, I just yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, and then we'll pass some. So, uh, but just this one from from uh, the chat from TTOS FFS. Can you explain what you mean by internet imperialism, or is that just another search project type term you use? Yeah, um, I use it because. Um, my practice is intentionally about positive failures and it's quite playful, um, but it also has really dark implications. And I want to, to find some way in the way I talk about my practice to acknowledge that this is a very dark thing. And I don't wanna dwell there. I don't wanna to have to make work that looks like that. I want us to be able to learn about the internet through my practice without having to be in a bad mood about it. Um, but by calling myself an internet imperialist, I'm connecting it also to the whole history of image imperialism and imperialism in general. So the following question comes from uh, Elizabeth Hansen. I'm gonna ask her to, to unmute the um, microphone uh, to make it- Hello. Yeah, there she is. Hi. Um, first, this is absolutely brilliant. You are absolutely brilliant. And I was not aware of your work before. I'm so happy to have come across it and to hear you tonight. I was I was howling with delight. My son was coming over and telling me to be quiet because I was making too much noise. <laughs> so first, thank you so much for that. Sweet, and my question you. is, and congratulations on the upcoming shows or the current shows. Um, how do you physically, um, how, do, how do your physical exhibitions present what you've shown us tonight? How do you incorporate that into the exhibitions? Great, that's a great question. And I hope you'll get to see one someday. Um, I, pref I like most, at least at this moment in time, as I'm um, building an understanding of my work, I like to show the vision boards and then have wall text that instru instructs people to 
search for something. I found if I show any sort of screen or recording of a screen, it seems faked or photoshopped, um, but the experience of taking out your own phone or your own iPad too and typing in best MFA and seeing on your own device, in your own home, you know, in, you know, you're logged into whatever and I've, I'm there, I've infiltrated that. So for me, I like to show the physical objects as the vision boards and let the digital and performance take place very distributed and not necessarily in the exhibition context. Um, I Pre-COVID, I was doing some fun projects where the walls of the vision board, sorry, the walls of the galleries were becoming community vision boards where anywhere I didn't have a piece hanging, people could come in and I had all the materials on the floor and there were like fake flowers and little ballerinas and everything I normally use and people could add their own aspirations to the wall. And that's something I've been hoping to do at all my exhibitions, but COVID has made that um, difficult with the whole sharing of glue guns and various spaces things. So I'm I'm really hoping to do that in um, in Austria this fall. Um, but I I really can't wait to have an exhibition where you guys can all come and partake in that physical gluing of gems and talking about what we want together, and then also celebrating it. Um, at the same time, when I did this for my Whitney Biennial hack, um, I gave a speech that was about the speech I would give if I were in the Whitney Biennial and my sister came into town and we celebrated as if it were the Whitney Biennial, um, which was quite performative, obviously, but then also really um, does a lot to like, I don't know, remind me that like what I want is to make art in a community of people and like maybe have my sister there with a glass of champagne. So like, <laughs> kind of there. <laughs> do I need the Whitney Biennial? I mean, I do, but anyway. <laughs> Lovely, thank you. Thanks so much. Um, Ginger Howard is next. If you wanna unmute yourself, go ahead. Great, I'm entranced. Absolutely loving your presentation. Thank you so much. How did you get here? <laughs> Looking back, what are there any big moments, Montessori preschool? Uh, you know what I mean? What, what were turning points where you said, oh my gosh, I'm not going there, I'm gonna do this. Yeah, I mean, there've been like a lot of them, but like one of them very much was when I was um, at Google, I was right out of school and I worked in HR in Google. So like, I didn't have any insider secrets, but I was part of the Silicon Valley culture. I worked there for like less than two years out of college but it was supposed to be my dream job. It was like, this was supposed to be the best company in the world to work for. I was getting paid more than like my parents ever made. And I was just so unhappy there. And I decided at that point that the internet was going to make me into something new. I very much believe and believed in the educational potential, like somewhat utopian thing of the internet. And I wasn't experiencing it where I thought I was going to experience it in the heart of Silicon Valley. And I, that's what I said. I was like, well, the internet's gonna make me into an artist. So like YouTube videos and Stanford online and practice-based research and like all of that was such a huge part of my early evolution. While well, what I had studied was information theory. Um, and then I think the next other big turning point was when I started to make vision boards instead of oil paintings where like at the end of 2019, I had been doing the search engine manipulation thing for like three years. Um, I thought it was pretty cool. I just felt like it wasn't going anywhere or not going, not going anywhere, but like, I felt there was some kind of disconnect with it. And what I found is like, I had been since trying to enter the art world, been trying to get taken seriously. I had been trying to do something very serious to work with very serious people to show up at exhibitions and not look like a gallery assistant. And like, then I like, I didn't know what to wear. And then you look like something you're trying too hard. And like, there's this whole like, Thing, but if I wore what I just wanted to wear and did what I just wanted to do, I felt like there was a bigger disconnect between me and artificial intelligence and digital technology and like manipulating political systems. So I almost like started making vision boards to be like, fuck it. I'm over trying to prove myself. Sorry, I was I not supposed to say that? <laughs> like, <laughs> sorry. Um, um, I'm over trying to prove myself. I'm over trying to look and be taken seriously. I'm manipulating the global internet and all of Google's AI. Like I'm gonna make something that looks like what people expect it to look like coming from me. 
And in doing that, me and my work started to coincide more authentically, both in where my power actually lies and in what people's perception and misinformation around that is. And that was like a very integrating um, aspect on this, on this path as well. Wow, thank you. Sorry about oh. Thank you. Very nice, very nice words to hear. It was an aptly placed word. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Ginger, and, and thank you, Gretchen, for your uh, reply. We have more questions. Uh, next will be Trinka. Uh, maybe Trinka can open the microphone and ask the question directly to, to Gretchen. Let's see. Hi, Gretchen. Um, I really love your playful work of art. You're sneaking in, and I really love it. And, but I also have a, a question which is maybe a little bit, I don't know, I just ask you, do you feel a certain kind of power when you're hacking into the this system and do you enjoy it? Yes, um, it's definitely a personal power trip as well. Like I, um, it's, it's um, I, I go after institutions and I go after companies, I don't go after people. Um, but people must know that I could. So <laughs> there's like, especially being um, a young woman trying to get into the art world, I definitely have for, I think in the way that my career has progressed, I've always had more power or have always felt more powerful than I think I, pre I, would, have, I would have otherwise. And um, that's not because I'm at all intending to ruin anybody's reputation, but because I intentionally build a very networked idea of success. I decided early on that I was only going to work with people that make all of the struggles of, and I mean, and not just make the struggles of the work worth it, but make the joyful moments the most joyful that they can be. Um, and so, yeah, there's definitely a certain confidence that I can get because my, um, my hack into the art world was as much technical as it was through press and through sort of sensation. Um, and that I think also gives me something as a young artist that um, a lot of people didn't have or wouldn't traditionally have before their first solo commercial show. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, everyone. Thanks uh, a lot, Gretchen. I think uh, it's been, really fantastic and I would like to thank you first of all also for the generosity of how much of your process that you shared all the behind the scenes that looks absolutely crazy <laughs> uh, in a good way of course. Um, one thing that I wanted to ask maybe if you could disclose also to the audience like um, how much of this work is going to uh, be done now in the rest like how long is it gonna take you now in the next few days and weeks and when can you expect to start googling this uh, record auction yeah um it will i won't be able to devote all of my internet checklist websites to this until after my show with anka Kulti, just because i don't want to um not like if this were the only project i were doing right now i could say like within three weeks um but i think more like mid-May is when you'll start to see a big like visual impact of these search results. Um, but sometimes it's sooner. Um, sometimes we get a little bit sooner, but you know, stay tuned. Also, yes, let us know if there's anything we can do to help. If we have to click like, <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I don't do this through networks, um, through networks of people generally, but um, yes, like if you go on to Twitter and just retweet what I just did, like that also helps. But then even um, like the, it's, yeah, the, there is something magic about just talking about my practice and having people be interested in it. I do think there's a whole network of energy that um, your guys' attention this evening has put into this work and will continue to perpetuate it forward. And I do think that you have a sincere, since we were speaking about sincerity and not breaking any terms of laws, I think you have acquired a sincere group of 
uh, fans here will be happy to sincerely <laughs> like and support your project. <laughs> yes. I mean, share sincerely, right? That's the, that's the end. <laughs> that's what we're all about here at Screenworks as well, right, John? Yeah, that's right. Uh, and I want to sincerely thank you <laughs> for this amazing uh, presentation today and for uh, taking us over how like the networks uh, work in relationship to, to desire and uh, being so generous, as Marco said, on, on, on sharing on your, on your practice. Also want to thank everyone in the audience for, for, for joining us and for also sending all those questions and taking part of the, of the event. Um, before we go, I just want to say that we have another skin work in two weeks uh, with uh, Jack, and uh, Zizi and me. It's going to be a quite interesting uh, screen work on drag guns. Uh, we invite you all to, to come in two weeks on the 7th of, of April. And, and uh, thing, sorry, um, I just wanted to remember so that we don't forget. We have just a small favor to ask at the end. If you have one minute to please help us fill a few questions, if you could go to screenworks.com slash poll. Um, there's just eight questions and that helps us understand better where you heard about us and how we can improve uh, the series and so on. So that's screenworks.com slash poll. 